so far. Let's go ahead and say that bless again. Let's go eat. Amen. But it's good to be here today at Gethsemane. You all forgive me. I, uh, you know, I always talk with people say I'm under the weather. I'm like, we're all under the weather. You know, it's whether it's the sun or whatever. But I, uh, I'm not feeling too well, if you would. But that's okay. Because I'm a firm believer that the God that I serve is able to do the uttermost. That's right. So pray for me, pray with me. I'm just excited to be in the house of the Lord on this day. But God said, this is the day that comes to me. And we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Yay, he made all seven days, but this way he is a special day. Right. God said it's a day that he did three things. He set it aside, he blessed it, he sanctified it, he made it holy. Then he invites us all to come into worship with him on this special day. Amen. And so for you all who are here worshiping, you have entered into a very special time. Yeah. You know, I don't want to say like Rod Serling with the Twilight Zone. You've entered into the Twilight Zone. But I would like to say that you've entered into the God Zone. Amen. And uh, I believe that God has indeed blessed us so far. Um, our young folk have just done an excellent job today, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, sometimes I hear folks say, young people don't do this and the young people don't do that. And you know, hence is the background, the premise of the sermon today. What type of letter are you? What type of letter are you? I'm appreciative that my family is here. My wife is here with me. And, uh, next month, on December 16th, will be 24 years of marriage. My sister is here, and my niece and my grandniece are here with us as well. And uh, my son is here, and a good friend is with him as well. Um, my son, who is 13 now, who is about five foot ten, he somehow thinks he is he's bigger than daddy now. But um, you know, I have to just keep him informed that I still got a little bit of skills left. Amen. Right. Amen. But uh, appreciative to God for one, secondly from your pastor, Pastor Johnson, and uh, you know he does a great job as the treasurer of this conference, but also more importantly as the pastor of this great congregation. Um, appreciative of the invitation. I look forward to coming to Raleigh each year. I was talking with my wife, and I was like, man, we've been coming here now around this time for like the last four or five years. So I guess I'm now used to it. I hope it continues. Amen. 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 And, <laughs> I just want to uh, recognize a couple of people, Pastor Michael Hickman, good to see you. Uh, brother, you know, Brother Charles on the piano, maybe not, not you know, I you know Brother Charles is way back in Charleston days, and, uh, and there are others, you know, Reggie, one of my classmates up in Southern, you know, so it's real good to see you all, and uh, I, I don't know, and, and then the rest of y'all, <laughs> the rest of y'all, y'all know who you are, all of you. What type of letter are you carrying? Um, before we get down to this, let me just share a couple of things. Um, for all our pathfinders who might be in the team leadership training, we are doing uh, a team leadership training the, uh, the weekend of January 23rd through the 25th in Orangeburg. So if you go online to Plus Line and please register for that. Um, also, in the first weekend of March, March 6th through the 8th, for those who may have been a master guide, um, we're going to be doing a Master Guide recertification for the South Atlantic Conference. And that's going to be held at the campground. So if you've been a Master Guide and you have kind of like let things move along and you've just kind of got into other aspects of life and that has fallen by the wayside, if you're interested in becoming recertified and getting that ministry going again where your um, skill and talent can be used to help build up this next generation of leaders, then I invite you to please come and we will have more information about that. March 27th and 28th will be our third annual Youth and Young Adult Convocation. How many of y'all have been there? There in Orangeburg. Not, well, praise the Lord. Amen. But folks, we have a wonderful time. This year's theme is Kononia, the Fellowship of All Believers. And we also have wonderful seminars that are done. Um, this past year we did one on how to start your own business. 
And I know we're going to talk about that this evening, right? Um, another thing is how to avoid a jerk or a jerk in your relationship. How to choose the right person. Amen. 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 Lord knows, some of us have chosen wrong people. We go to sleep every night. Um, how to recover from divorce, suicide, um, Christian leadership, um, disabilities ministries. And as a matter of fact, our disabilities ministry is going to partner with us in a very uh, a greater role this time coming around. And so, folks, if you want to understand what it means to minister to the dis disabled in our congregation, please come. The event is free. Amen. The event is free. Because, <laughs> you know, some of my colleagues, they do some of these same things in different conferences, and it's normally a $200 fee. But we're saying it's free. Amen. Then you're getting training. Amen. Amen. And you can come back, and you can apply to your own personal lives. You can apply to the church, and you can apply to the community. And so my firm belief is that if we can, on a grassroots level, engage, encourage, and empower our youth and our young adults, my Lord, what might this church be? Yeah. I was just in a meeting this past week, and people were saying, oh, we're losing all of our folk. And, and part of me is like, well, maybe, maybe not. But I know that if they are engaged, and, and we need to, you know, some of us need to move beyond this, where... I had to pay my dues before I was a deacon in the church. So you're going to have to pay your dues before you're the deacon in the church. We've got some youth and young adults who are project managers who, who, who oversee multi-million dollar projects. Right. We have uh, CPAs and accountants who deal with millions of dollars, yea, even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they can't be a treasurer of the church. Why not? Well, well, well. Mm. And this is not something to get on It's just a realization that we spend all this time raising them to be something in the world. But then, when it comes time for their services to be given to the church, we tell them, well, you're not quite good enough. Why is it that they're good enough for the devil, but they're not good enough for God? So if you want to see them in the church, then, you know, there's a sermon that I did called, Are You Leaving a Resume or a Legacy? See, resumes are built to show people who you are. Legacies go on after you have gone on. So the question is, what are you leaving? A resume or a legacy? And so my challenge to you is, stop looking at the negative. Uphold the positive. And say, you know what? Hey, what I did was wrong, and I'm sorry. You realize how big, how far an apology would go? I'm sorry. I did this wrong. Forgive me. Can we move forward now? They'll look at you like you're crazy, but they'll walk with you. But I didn't come to talk about that too much. I just came to encourage you. Encourage them in the Lord. Amen. Well, one writer says that they're either going to rise up in the judgment and bless us, or going to rise up in the judgment and curse us. I don't know about you. Anybody ever been cussed out? I don't like it either. So imagine somebody in front of God cussing you out. Or imagine somebody in front of God blessing you. That should put something different on you. All right. What type of letter are you? Follow me your people. In Jesus' name, we need a Amen. In your Bible is the book of Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. And the time is 1239. And so give me a half an hour and we'll get on that. Okay? Do what I gotta do. Praise the Lord. The folks tell me do what I gotta do. Oh Lord, I gotta call the blanks now. I'm about to preach. Nehemiah chapter 2. Are you there? You got it? If you don't have a Bible, do you have a smartphone with a Bible app? Who, who here has a smartphone and you don't have the Bible app on it? 
Then who has a talent? All right, you got the bottom line on it? Amen. Praise the Lord. So if you have your smartphones or your Bible, I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. The Bible says in the month of Nisan, or Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. And now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Thank you. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? This is some people's homes we're talking about. Have mercy. Mm -hmm. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? And when will you return? So I, it, it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to the gov to me, given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And let Asaph, the keeper of the king, as far as that he may give me timber to make beams for the great fortress of the temple. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. What letters are you carrying? It's interesting, as I was doing some research on this, I found that the month of Nisan, in the Assyrian calendar is referred to as a month of happiness. Therefore, this is why the king asked ne Nehemiah, why are you sad, considering this is supposed to be a month of happiness. If we were to consider when is this time of the year, it's between March and April on our calendar. So we're talking early spring, and here it is, Nehemiah is sad in the presence of the king during a time when everybody was partying and having a good time. How many of y'all like to have a good time? Amen? Amen? The Bible says that Nehemiah was a king's cup bearer, and this was not uh, any ordinary position. You had to be a trusted individual to be the king's cup bearer. Because people would try to kill the king, they would try to poison the king. And so when Nehemiah's, uh, his job was to ensure that number one, he kept the king's cup. He did not give that cup to anybody. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah was so trusted with the king's life that whenever it came time that they had to pour a little wine in there, Nehemiah had to taste the wine. Right. I know some of us may be a little bit upset about that, that God was using alcoholic, but he did. <laughs> I'm not saying Nehemiah was an alcoholic, but he had to taste the wine. And so everywhere the king went, Nehemiah had to taste the wine. So you know that he was a little, probably a little tipsy from time to time. But the fact is, he was a trusted man, and God put him in that position because, watch this, there was going to come a time when God needed this trusted man to make a request of the king to rebuild his city. What I'm saying is that there are times that God is going to place us in positions that nobody else understands, but it's going to be for a time yet unknown that God will use that position that we're in so that somebody can do something to build up his kingdom, even if it's a pagan. We sometimes get angry with folk. Why are they working here? Why are they working there? You know, my challenge is, why should we question where they're working if it is something that they're doing that God can use them to build up his kingdom? Because the truth of the matter is, so many of us have gotten so used, so, so how shall I say, uh, comfortable, that we just give money for the gospel. We don't go out much anymore. When I was younger, they had this thing called in gathering. Right. You had to go out that little cup, and you had that little slot in the top, and you gave out the little magazine, and and you told folk about your 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 message, and you had to come back to the A Y, and the A Y was where you stood up here in the front, and you gave folk a testimony about what you did and how you experienced things. But now we're in a day and time. 
when folk are like, well, I just go to church because that's just my thing to do because it's a thing called habituation. I do it out of habit every week because I don't know what else to do. And so therefore we have to ask ourselves, does God trust me? What type of letter are you carrying? And so the Bible goes in it, and Nehemiah begins to talk with the king. First, he says, King, live forever. In other words, you couldn't be in the king's presence with a dour face, with a sad face, looking all kind of crazy because the king would think, wait a minute, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> and so King Artaxerxes said, ne Nehemiah, what's going on, man? You're not sick. What's the problem? How can I be happy when my, the city of my father's lies in ruins? I beg a question. How can we be happy when the churches of God looks like a war zone? How can we be happy when the work of God is not going forward? How can we be happy when we're not doing our part? And it means that we have to take our young children and, and take them out with us sometimes. I mean, you know, what are you afraid of? That's right. When we go before kings, large petitions we ought to bring. What do you mean by that, preacher? What I'm saying is, when we go to God, we don't need to go to God asking for an ear of corn. We need to go to God asking for a field of corn. All right, man. Sometimes some folk ask me, uh, why do you ask those things? I say, because I'm not afraid. What are they going to tell me? Either yes or no. Is that the end of the world? No. Absolutely not. You know, there's like some young ladies. I used to, I tried to get their hand up a few years ago, some time ago. It was well over 24 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you, but guess what? When they see me now, <laughs> then I tell them, talk to the hand. Because <laughs> God already gave me a woman. <laughs> Chance. Step back. <laughs> Get back. God work through Nehemiah. Let's go ahead and get on down into this thing. Nehemiah said, King, the city of my fathers, where they're buried, lies in ruins. The place has been burned down, the walls have been knocked down, and and the report has come back to me, and King, I am sad because I need to go back and rebuild that because Nehemiah was thinking, you know, one day I may need to go back there one day and be buried. But it's interesting because three different times they had gone, you know, to try and rebuild this wall. Ezra had gone back and they laid the foundation and things got stopped. And then another time, the other governor went and things got stopped. And now Nehemiah is coming in. And I want you to understand something that just because things just not, does not happen when you think they ought to happen does not mean it's not going to happen. Because God says, I've got a plan and I know the plan and I know when it needs to be enacted because if it's enacted too soon, some people are going to get caught up in themselves thinking, look at the great things that I've done. So God has to sometimes take us into a barren land and into some dire straits so that we'll know that it is God who did this and not ourselves. Amen. So Nehemiah, he asked the king, he said, king, this is what I want to do. And the king said, well, go ahead. What do you need? And notice what Nehemiah he said. He said, king, give me letters. You know, when I was in the Navy, um, there was no such thing as email, mm -hmm. cell phones, mm -hmm. text messaging. <laughs> when I was younger, you know, I grew up way across the other side of North Carolina. I was born in a little town called Eden. Anybody ever heard of Eden, North Carolina? That's where I was born, Eden, North Carolina. That's why I tell my wife, there's a garden of Eden in the Bible, that's the Eden right here. That's where I was born. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Say amen, baby. Say, yes, say amen for your husband. Don't let folks think that. My son's up there shaking his head like my daddy's. He's on the map. It's okay. You know, I'm a Tar Heel fan. Amen, amen. 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 That's right. You know, God in the Tar Heel, the White Scar Carolina Blue. That's all I'm just trying to say. Amen, amen. You know, I just went to uh, we, we, the hotel we stayed at last night, and one of the things Sister Gabriel for that. Um, you know, the lady I walked in with my Carolina hat on, she was like, well, we don't serve Carolina folks. I'm looking at her like that. 
then I found out she went to NC State. That's a whole waste of money, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> you can all right. Now, I know there's some Duke fans, you know, and uh, that's okay. I mean, you know, we're still little brothers still trying to be big brother. That's okay. Um, but folks, let me get back to I just, you know, I like where I'm from. So anyway, he goes back. He says, "Can you give me a letter?" And he says, "Because I need a letter to let folks know that I'm about business." And when I was in the Navy, and we were writing letters back and forth. As I said, there was no email, no text messaging, and all that. We would sit back and write letters, you know, on notebook paper and all that other good stuff. Like this young man is up here writing on his. Amen. Praise the Lord. You got a word for you, son. I love you. All right? I don't want you to forget that. I love you. And now I'm going to use this right here. All right? And when you see this, this is front and back. All right? Y'all notice what I did. All right? That's what Jesus does for us. He recognized sin, but then he turned the page and there's a blank. He said, you can't see nothing now. Amen? That's a hallelujah moment right there. Praise the Lord. Amen? There's sin on the back of the page, but he's got a clean slate. Amen? We would write on the front and back of the paper because we didn't want to waste anything. And we would also tell each other how much we love them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we would write each other, we would put some smell good on the letter. Anybody ever, oh no, y'all ever wrote the letter, put your little kisses on it, and, you know, little hearts and all that stuff like that. How much I love you, I wish I, you know. And one of the greatest things, anybody ever been in the military in here, you know, and there's this thing called mail call. Mm -hmm. When they said mail call, boy, everybody and his brother were waiting for a letter. And there were times, friends, that I wouldn't get anything in, and I'm just finding them down, but, but I had hope because in my previous experience, I knew that if I didn't get a letter this mail call, there were bound to be several letters next mail call. And so when I got those letters, I would just sit there and I would read them over and over and over again because in those letters, it was expressing everything. This is how my day has gone. This is how much I love you. This is what we're planning on doing. And, and the thing about letters is that it allows a person that is being communicated with to know what's going on. And so uh, Nehemiah asked the king, he said, look here, king, I need some letters because it's one thing for me to go in my own, but it's a whole different thing to go with the authority. That's right. And so what I'm saying is that because God's word is our letter, and we are God's children. When we walk out into the world, what do they read? How do they read us? Follow me on this. You get mad all you want, but watch this. If I look at, think, chalk, and all everything else like the world, then the world reads the same mirror. They write on themselves, this is who I am, this is what I want to be. But when they see the child of God, do they see the word of God or do they see the mirror? Because I'm a firm believer that the more we try to be like the world, the less our effectiveness is. This is why even though Nehemiah was a trusted cupbearer for the king, he realized his position did not give him authority. Therefore, he said, I need from you, king, letters to let folk know that your trusted cupbearer has the authority to go and do what he has requested of you to do. What I'm saying is that there are times that God has given you and I the mission not to go out and tell everybody how good you are, but so that people can read you and see how good God has been in your life. I don't know about you, but I know there's been some times that I couldn't, I didn't see my way through, but God made a way out of no way. Is there a witness in the house today? I don't know about you, but I know there have been times when you go into the house and you know you ain't paid a light bill, 
you flipping the switch anyway. Right, right. Thinking that the light somehow by osmosis is going to come on. But I remember when my wife and I, we were in school and our son right there who was a baby. And, and, and it's interesting because we didn't have any money to pay the gas bill. And it was one of the coldest winters on record. And we had a small space heater and another heater. And I remember praying at the beginning of winter, Lord, we don't have the money because we're trying to make it through. But God, we're going to cry to you. And I'm asking you right now, God, keep this house warm. You all, anybody remember the old days when you used to try to open up the oven so it can warm the house? That wasn't working that time. Uh, I said, God, you need to take these spaces. And I'm trying to tell y'all, when you talk to the God, my God, the miracle working God, the God because as he takes these letters, the letters are now sealed uh, in a, in a, they put them in these little clay tubes and then they take the king's seal and put hot wax on it and take his ring and put his signia on it. God does the same thing for you and I. When he delivers us out of this world, he places us in his own special tube. And then he takes the hot wax but I will say he takes the blood of Jesus. And then he takes his own hand and then he puts his own imprint on it. So when others see us, they say that must be a child of God. But what if you're up there living like the world, acting like the world, you're getting down like the world. What does the world say about you? And more importantly, what do your children say about you? It trips me out because I have parents come to me, has to pray for my child. Why? Uh -huh. Well, because they run out of the world. Why? Uh -huh. Well, because they, they aren't doing what God says do. You know, I had a, a parent, some parents come to me one day. And they was like, Pastor, talk to our sons. They got their ears pierced. Uh -huh. So me being the good preaching. I go over there, I'm like, boys, y'all know y'all need to take that out of you. And so all of a sudden, they're sitting there, they're mad. I'm like, well, what's wrong? You don't understand, you don't understand. Okay, well, help me understand. They were there when we got our ears pierced, so I put the earrings right back in there. <laughs> then I went to the parents and I said, don't you ever try to get me to do what God has already called you to do. What I'm saying, folks, right. is that the first letter your children read are you. Yes. How in the world are you going to expect the church mm -hmm. to be a letter to your child? That's right. And God's word to be a letter to your child when you are doing everything that you know isn't right. That's right. Amen. Amen. I know. That's okay. Because we're living in the last day. That's right. And the Bible is very clear. That people want teachers having itching ears. Just like Isaiah says, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 10. Mm -hmm. Preaching to us smooth things. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't want to hear the truth. Yeah. You know, that's your problem. But my God called me to speak the truth. Yeah. And hold not back. So if you don't like it, talk to the author. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, I ain't one of these preachers going to make you feel good. You know, we got too many Adventist preachers who just want to preach a little feel-good messages and want to hoop and holler and run around. No, because there comes a point in time where if it's all that you're getting, that's just a Twinkie diet. Right. And eventually you got to get some pinto beans, some collard greens, some corn bread, tomatoes, and all that other stuff. Because 
Because there comes a point in time when the body needs something to sustain it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Amen. Nehemiah goes and he gets these letters. And as he goes through, he gets to where he's going. He gets to Jerusalem. And the Bible says that, that uh, during the nighttime, he took him himself and a few other people. They rode around. They looked at the place. But I want to encourage you today that just because somebody tries to take you out does not mean anything. Because when God has you in the palm of his hand, there's nothing that nobody can do to you. What do I mean? I mean this. You go back and as you begin to read in Nehemiah chapter 4 and you move on through chapters 8, you find that there's this brother named Tobiah and Sanballat. And these brothers came up and they tried to say to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, you know, it's good to see you, brother. You ever find them old fake people? <laughs> fake as a $3 bill. <laughs> Want to come up in your face and smile and laugh? How you doing? Hey, Pastor Carter, I'm looking at them like, you know, uh -uh. <laughs> No, see, got no time for fake people. Amen. <laughs> you know, shucks. We're, in the, we're living in the last days, people. I mean, look around us. Some people sit back and say, well, y'all been saying this, you know, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Yes, but Jesus is coming. Yes. Jesus is coming. You know, when I was younger, they used to tell me, Jesus is coming soon. I never thought we'd see the year 2000. Right. And here we are in 2014. But guess what? Jesus is still coming. Yes. And you want to know why I know? When you look at the world around us, there used to be a point in time you go to your neighbor get a cup of sugar. This time you go to your neighbor, you might be trapped in the basement for 10 years. <laughs> Your kids used to be able to run up and down the street, you know, the worst that would happen to them, they acted up. They got a whooping from the neighbor and you. Right. Now they might get caught up and taken away and put into some sex trafficking area. You never know. The Bible says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. Isn't it not cold? Yeah. And if judgment is to begin at the house of Israel, what does it say for the rest of the world? In other words, if God is going to start with the church, and the church folk are going to barely make it. What, what does the world have? Not a snowball's chance in, you know what I'm saying. Uh -huh. Nehemiah gets there and he has a mission from God. And let me share this. Whenever God gives you something, don't let anybody get you off track. <laughs> because Sambalot and Tobiah began to try and, 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 and pick at Nehemiah. Oh, Nehemiah, I don't even know why you're here. Your other folk tried to come. Your other homeboys tried to do it. They couldn't do it. So therefore, you ain't going to be able to do it. But Nehemiah never said a word. See, here's the thing. Here's the success and how to have success. You ever heard all these people got the secret to success? Uh -huh. Ten secrets to success. Five secrets to success. Twenty-nine secrets to success. I'm so sick and tired of all these secrets to success. There is no secret to success. The only secret is an open secret, and that is obey God, do his commandments, and he will bless you. That is not a secret. That is a promise that has been in existence for over millennials times millennials. Amen. The secret is this. When God gives you something, you follow it through. Amen. Young folk, if God has called you to go into ministry, don't let your mom and dad or whoever else tell you you ought to be a doctor. Amen. Because they're trying to get you to look like the world instead of God. Amen. Well, I want them to have a good job. What? What is better than being with God who can give you the desires of your heart? You know, some of my colleagues say, we don't make enough money. I'm looking at them. Some of y'all sure ain't skinny. <laughs> They're not anorexic to me. I remember, yeah, I, told, I remember times, man, when, you know, old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard and the cupboard was bad. All right. But God has been faithful. Amen. Yes, he has. You know, I don't make a whole lot of money, but I make enough. I ain't starving. Amen. I have a roof over my head. My lights are on. I got some food in the refrigerator. My wife has a job. Amen. 
Amen. My children are okay. Amen. Matter of fact, one daughter just got married back in September, and they just closed on a brand new house last Friday. God is good. <laughs> 25 years old. Amen. What? That's right. Oh, I know my wife and I look about 25 by ourselves. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Right. You know, we fool people like that a whole lot. Y'all you know? got children how old? Now we have another daughter who's getting ready to finish up college next month. Amen. 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 You got that right. Praise him. Amen. Lord have mercy. Somebody told me a, a couple of months ago, as they finish school and get into their home, it becomes a pay raise for you. I said, Lord. That's a prophetic message. <laughs> <laughs> so now we got one more to go. He's got a ways to go. But our other daughter, who's a biochemistry major at Oakwood University, Amen. wants to go on to be a pharmacist. Praise the Lord. That's right. Amen. Just whatever you do, just understand. Amen. You're your own man. <laughs> yes, you can come here and spend the night. That's right. We'll even give you a week. Amen. Come Monday morning. <laughs> Where am I going? I don't know. <laughs> Go with God. <laughs> but the Lord made a promise in His Word. He says, If you honor me, I'll honor you. And I will bless your children. That's what He said. And I can also say that although I, you know, my wife and I, we, we tried our best to be faithful. Mm -hmm. And God is blessed. Amen. I mean, I'm serious. My daughter, our daughter is 25 years old, y'all. Amen. She drives a BMW X5, the, the SUV. Amen. When we had a car, we had to chip in together. $1,800. I know, I know right? A Cavalier. Amen. Right now. All door, red on top, gray on the bottom. Four cylinder. Can't outrun the police in that. <laughs> but God has been good. He says, if you're faithful, yes. I'll be faithful to you. Yes. Nehemiah was faithful because as Sambalot and Tobiah tried to discourage him, they tried to talk about him. They tried to discourage him from building the wall. But let me share something with you. When God calls you to begin to rebuild walls in your home, don't you let anybody tell you that you can't do it. You may need to rebuild the wall of relationships with you and your estranged children. Oh, I'm talking some real talk now. Because some of us have kicked our children out. And we feel that we're in the right. And God has been convicting us over years that you know what you did was wrong. They had a baby with that old sorry so-and-so. And what? It's still your grandchild. Amen. He who is without sin among you has the first stone. You see, the problem I have is this. We expect our children to have the same knowledge that took us bumps and bruises to get. And we want them to have that when they're five and six years old. Wait a minute. It took you all this time and you still don't have it right. So how in the world do you expect them to be five years old and to know what a 45-year-old person knows? It's impossible. Because the truth is, some of us are still stupid. Or well, our student. <laughs> Come in church raising H E double L. Arguing over positions. Or who should have a position. Arguing over who should sing and who shouldn't sing. That's trivial, y'all. What if we got out there and started talking about, wait a minute, how about that person down the street that's been in this community for so long and they still don't know what y'all do? We act we like we're going past out of steps of Christ or a track. We've done our duty. It's more than that, folks. We've got to go and tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you got to go there and have this drop down on 27 amazing or 31 amazing facts Bible study right there in the first five minutes. But you can go there and let them read the letter of your life. And say, you know what? I have a church home. I would love for you to visit. And then if they say, well, I'll visit your church. You come and visit my church. Okay, folks, go visit the church. All right? It ain't going to kill you. All right? It really isn't. All right? It really is. You know, but they just get in there and start doing some things that you just really don't feel comfortable about. You know, you just hold your finger. 
But sometimes the reason we don't get with folk is because we ostracize people based upon our elitist attitude that I have truth and you don't. Jesus came to an elitist group of people and he rejected those same of the world. God has called us to be a letter so that people can read. As Paul says over there in Romans, he says, you know, you are our letters. Written not with pen, but with the Holy Spirit. Not on the tables of stone, but on the tables of our hearts. In other words, when I am with God, it should not be something that is on the Ten Commandments on stone, as Moses says, because God then transfers those to our heart. And if I'm still not doing what God says to, then I have a problem. And follow me, follow me on this. There's never any excuse to do the wrong thing. There's never a right way to do wrong. Let me get back to my sermon. That is the sermon. Nehemiah said, I'm not going to pay any attention to you because I'm on a God mission. And when you're on a God mission, you cannot get distracted. You know, when I was in the Navy, they gave us orders and that's what we had to do. You could not deviate. Not one iota. Unless the tactical situation determined that you change. But too many folk in the church, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, want to change the message to reflect Satan. We're too busy trying to outworld the world. I'm no different than you. Yes, I am. Yes, I am different. No, I'm not different in the fact that I am still a person who's born in sin, shaping in iniquity. But I am different because I'm putting my all in all in Jesus Christ. And I'm doing my very best to follow him and do what he says too. So does that make me different? Yes, it does. Does it make me better than you? No, it doesn't. But it says that I'm trying to do better and I'm trying to be better. And so therefore, if God wants me to be a letter, then I have to be a true letter. I mean, think about it. What if my wife and I exchange all these letters expressing our love for each other, and then I get home and she's like, I don't love you, and I say, I don't love her. All that was for naught. The Bible says Nehemiah began to do his work. And all of a sudden, people began to try and discourage him. He said, don't worry about it. They kept building. And they kept building. And then one day they came and they said to them, you know what? A fox can go up into that wall. It's so shoddy. And knock it down. What they were trying to say is that the progress that you have made is still no good. That's what some folk in the church want to tell you. The progress you've made is okay, but it ain't good enough. Hold on. If I am with God and the Holy Spirit, whatever step I take is all progress and it's always a good thing. So understand that. See, I, I kind of grew up in this church and one of the things that I hated above all and I still couldn't understand is a young lady would get pregnant out of wedlock and everybody would want to kick out of the church. <laughs> yeah, they're going to talk about the woman caught in adultery. God said go and sin no more. Well, we're going to kick you out. We're going to do Bible studies with you. We're going to rebaptize you. If it were me, I'd like, keep your Bible studies and keep your baptism because I ain't got time for that. It's interesting because, and I'm just saying this because God has been gracious to me. Some of my, some of my friends that I came up with, I was on Bible Bowl team. And we were doing things we had no business doing. I know I was. Smoking, drinking, running around, doing things I had no business doing. That's right. Such as some of you. Till God gave. <laughs> All right. I'm only talking about me. I'm only talking about me. All right, because I, you know, I really don't have an issue talking about where God brought me from. Because you know, as I said last night, once He tells me to rise, take up my bed and walk. He tells me to rise, get up. That means I got to take some action. Take up my bed. That means I got to take what I got to get away from the situation I found myself in. Because the thing is, situations are still there. And many of us fall into those same situations just because we refuse to get out of it because we love it too much. I was talking to someone on the phone. They was like, well, 
uh, I'm with this individual and we're not married, but they're married and but we love each other. But I go to church every Sabbath. Man, going to church ain't got nothing to do with you, what you're doing. We think going to church is somehow some panacea. Lord, have mercy. I read that word earlier this week, y'all. I was waiting for a chance to use it. But the word panacea means it's a cure-all. Y'all got that? So some of us think going to church is a what? Panacea or a what? Cure-all. If church, watch this, church does not change you. It's the Holy Spirit that changes us. And we cannot continue to live in sin thinking that coming to church is somehow enough for God to say, that's good. God is looking to deliver us out of stuff so that when people see this letter, they can say, wait a minute. This is somebody who used to be, but now they are this way and they can see the handwriting of God on you. Simon and Tobiah also enlisted the support of some of the church folk to try and discourage Nehemiah. Matter of fact, one of the prophets that's, that worked side by side with Nehemiah said, Nehemiah, let's go into the temple and hide because they're trying to kill you. Nehemiah said, what kind, of, what kind of man would that be, would I be, if I run and hide in the temple? I know y'all trying to kill me because you don't want me to do the work that God has called me to do. You're going to find some assassins in the church that's going to try and take you out because you're trying to do a thus says the Lord. And I'm here today to encourage somebody. God has a place upon you to do something, but you keep looking to the church to somehow underwrite what you, God has called you to do. God says the silver and gold is mine. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. See, too many people keep looking to the church to do ministry that God has called them to do. And watch this. All ministry that God does never takes place in the church. It takes place out in the world. So I'm talking to the young adults now. Everybody want to come and have the church do something for them. Take yourself out and get involved with ministry. It's when you get involved. You know, when you go to the club, you don't go up there. On the wall. <laughs> on the wall. You ever seen the people in the club? They jamming on the wall. Some of y'all must have been in the club. <laughs> but I found that I had more fun when I got off the wall. They got on the floor. You know, I'm up there, you know. <laughs> 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 my cabbage patch and, you know. Anybody? Yeah. I'm taking some fun way back. Way back. You know, popping and locking. You know, and it's so funny because they got all these people who doing robot dances on yeah. YouTube and all this and the other. I'm like, hey, please, we got a cousin named Moochie that used to do the robot way back in 1978, you know. <laughs> And everybody act like something is brand new. There's nothing new under the sun. Yes. Let me go ahead and wrap this up. The servant of God must expect every kind of discouragement. But you should never let it get you, get you off track. Go ahead and give me some going home music, bro, y'all. I said 30 minutes, I'm a little bit old. My point in all of this, number one is, you are God's letter to the world. <clears throat> and it's up to you to make sure that your message is consistent. Amen. Does the Bible change? No. The word of God is consistent and continual. So should our lives be. Let me share something else to you that might be startling to some. The Bible, you remember when the woman who was caught in adultery, Jesus says, go and what? Do you remember the man that Jesus healed of the leprosy? And then 
the man came back and he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, and the man, Jesus told the man, he said, go and sin no more unless the worst thing come upon you. The Bible tells us in 1 John, I believe, it says that uh, we don't have to sin. I'm firm to believe that even in this sinful world, I don't have to sin. You see, you got to understand, temptation is not sin. Temptation is a suggestion. That's all it is. But if I believe that the Bible says, my Lord and your Lord was tempted in all points as we were, yet he didn't sin. That means that I don't have to sin. It does not mean I won't be bombarded with thoughts. But if a thought comes here, then the Bible says, then taking all those things and taking them and capturing them in the name of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10. Watch this. My letter should be consistent. My life should be consistent. And then the final point is this. When people try to discourage me, let me look to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made the heavens and the earth. I've got some folk who hate on me because they think that because I'm the youth director for the South Atlantic Conference, that somehow or another, I've done something to get myself here. The only thing I've done, y'all, was said, let me give y'all a simple prayer. Here's the story. The deacons in the church and the people in the church was a little bothered by the fact that this church member by the name of Jimmy seemed to get blessed all the time. And they were like, well, Jimmy seems to get blessed all the time. Why is it that Jimmy gets blessed all the time? And when we pray, we don't seem to get that. So they got a board meeting together. <laughs> and they took a contingent out to Jimmy's house and they said, Jimmy, we want to know what makes you special? Why is it that it seems like God answers your prayers? He said, focus simple. I say to the Lord, Lord, this is Jimmy, and I'll take what you give me. <laughs> Too often it's the case we're asking God for all these other things. It will simply be, Lord, I'll just take whatever you give me. Because every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, and whom there's no variableness, no shadow of eternity. And the thing that I like so much about a story, have you all ever read those stories? In the beginning. But then it says, and so they live happily ever after. The end. What I'm saying today is that, like Nehemiah, who asks letters from the king, we need to ask God, Lord, let me be the letter to the world. So that when others see me, they see you. And so as the Bible says, that they may glorify your good works and glorify God that's in heaven. What I'm saying today is that we need to stop tripping on each other, be a letter that we can encourage each other with and encourage the world with so that when others see us, they see God and not what we used to be. So the question is, what type of letter are you carrying? Do you have a gossiping letter? It's time to cut it out. Do you have a backbiting letter? And you know, a backbiter is somebody that goes and, and they say one thing and then they come turn back and they, and they turn on you. Do you have a hypocritical letter? Do you have a lying letter? A cheating letter? Do you have a letter that says, I'm only going to give God 50% and I'm going to give Satan and everybody else the other 50%. You know, it's interesting because there are 24 hours in a day, right? And so if you multiply 24 times 7, what does that give us? 100 and what? 68, right? That's 168 hours in a week. And think about it. Most of us come to church for, on average, 4 hours a week. So that means there's 164 hours. What are we doing with? Okay, I'll give it that you studied your Sabbath school lesson, you're doing the devotion. 
So we'll give another, let's say, seven hours. Give you an hour a day. So now we're down to what, 37? Okay, we'll take out, let's say, 10 hours of work over five days. So that's 50 hours. So now we're down to uh, 87 hours in the week. What are you doing with the rest of that? Oh, I forgot. You got to watch Scandal. <laughs> Real Housewives of Atlanta. T.I. and Tiny Catfish. <laughs> if you like me, I like Animal Planet, you know. Spider-Man. BET 106 and Park. MTV Awards. How much personal time are you giving to God? 